All right, thank you for joining. Um, my name is Mark Shinney. I'm a technical product owner for Splunk. Been at Splunk for two years now. Feedback. Perfect. Um, so it's, it's great to be here as a vendor to talk to you about how great our solutions are. But most importantly, it's great to have a customer that actually, from a, one of the largest media publishing company in Europe, come here and join us to be able to talk about their day in the life of uh, using our software and how they can achieve operational excellence and be able to monitor some of their software. So we have Christian Rush joining me. He's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how they're uh, using Hi. Splunk. Who here uh, uses Splunk by any chance or has heard of Splunk using? Yes, so pretty much a good portion of the audience. That's great. Our mission statement is simple, right? We want to make machine data accessible, usable, and available to everyone. We have a rich layer of sources of information that we can actually collect in Splunk. And ultimately, we can make that data available for many use cases that you have within your organization to be able to satisfy that. Same data can be used to satisfy some application delivery use cases, IoT use cases, business analytics, as well as IT operations use cases. We have a rich ecosystem of over 1,000 applications built by our end users, our partners, and ourselves that are available on Splunk Base. We'd certainly recommend you checking them out. One of these data sources in the introduction of Docker has certainly made it an important aspect for us to be able to con contribute and collaborate inside of the Docker code base to be able to monitor a lot of these events coming from Docker ecosystems. New layers of abstractions, the ephemeral nature of Docker makes it even more complex to be able to monitor everything that's going on in inside your environments and the impacts that it can have on your end user quality. So we'll talk to you about all the different op uh, abilities to be able to monitor these container environments. Just out of curiosity, who here is in operations, has an operational role? Developers? Great. So I've had the opportunity to do both, be a developer and hand things over to operations, and had the opportunity to do a three-month engagement with one of the largest federal agencies with uh, the services over 20,000 um, citizens. And, and having to play the role of an operation, a person in operation is certainly very challenging. So we're going to show you how we can make this easier with Splunk. So three areas that we're going to cover today. One, how to get visibility within your container. And Christian will also talk quite a bit about that and what he does. That covers everything from what we've introduced in terms of a custom logging driver inside of the Docker engine. We also have the ability to monitor all kinds of other data sources available within Docker, other, other logging options, and also available to monitor some other orchestration engines such as um, UCP, Docker Swarm Mode, and AWS. Second is, how do you also monitor your container applications running both on-prem as well as in cloud environments? Right? The portability of Docker makes great flexibility, but at the same point, you want to make sure to get full visibility within these container environments. So in cloud, uh, we have very rich visibility into all of the AWS services, including EC2 container services. So within task definitions, you can actually specify the logging driver, or you can also deploy our, our packages as images. Same thing for Google Cloud Platform. Uh, you can actually monitor all of the GKE data using the PubSub subscription. These are all applications that are available in our Splunk base. Would recommend you looking at them. But most importantly is also understanding not only performance visibility, log information being collected from these environments, but also billing information. Right, be able to understand how the cost of this infrastructure for your container type environments is impacting uh, your availability or your business, your business costs. And then last, most importantly, we want to make sure that this is easy for you to get value out of. Right? You can actually download our bits within the hub, within Docker Store, be able to get going quickly. We also have a GitHub repo getting started that you can check out on Splunk, on the GitHub Splunk, and really easy to get going and start getting visibility within your container environments. We also have our forwarder. Our forwarder is our agent technology that's enabling you to collect all kinds of information from these Docker environments and be able to bring that back into Splunk. So a couple of collection options that I want to go in more details in. Um, as I mentioned, log options are an option that you have on your Docker D or per image. There's a lot more flexibility in this, pl in this Splunk logging driver that I'll talk to you about in the next slide that differentiates against all the other log options. 
but all the log options are supported, right? The big differentiator in Splunk in terms of a machine analytics platform is that we can support any type of data, right? We are not a structured data store, and what we do is at search time, we're able to search any type of data that you have in your system, whether it's JSON, XML, flat files, bring it all together and be able to see, drive some of that operational intelligence within that, that data that you're collecting. Forwarders, as I mentioned before, gives you a lot of flexibility in how to collect the data, can be deployed as an image on inside your container ecosystem, whether you're deploying in swarm mode, in Kubernetes, either as a global service or daemon set, or in Mesos. We also have further flexibility for developers within the, uh, if you go to dev.splunk.com, a lot of the logging drivers, uh, sorry, the, the .NET Java SDKs, Node.js SDKs, as well as um, Log4j can automatically be integrated and sent the data directly into Splunk. Talked about cloud and some of the custom, uh, we have a lot of customers that do, are doing some custom integration using our HTTP event collector. So HTTP event collector is a high stream data point that I'll talk about next because it's also being used by our logging driver. Uh, it's very common to be used with Kafka. Use it as a subscription, transform the data payload in whatever payload that you want to send to Splunk, and use our HTTP event collector to send the data. So our logging driver is a highly secure uh, endpoint that allows you to be able to not only authenticate the actual client using a secure token, but it also allows you to be able to configure, further configure access control of the data. So ultimately, if you have teams or groups within your organization that can only see information from a given image or from a given Docker D environment or your cluster environment, you have that level of configur con configurability within by using the, the, uh, the Splunk logging driver. Very simple to configure, right? It's included as part of the Docker engine. It's a contribution that we made back to Docker, and we wanted to make sure to give you that level of flexibility to be able to enable it uh, within an image or within the Docker D daemon. It scales. Um, I, we scale pretty much indefinitely, right? On per node, we scale greater than 60,000 events per second, and that can scale as, as, as large as you want. Um, we also have introduced, so this was introduced in 110. 113, we've added some new features, such as several performance en enhancements. We've also added the ability for uh, the Docker image not to block if it can't connect to the endpoint. That was one of the features that was initially introduced in 110, but we actually added that as a configuration parameter. Some customers didn't want the ability to not have the container run. Uh, so by one, in 110, the container will not run if it can't connect to the endpoint. In 113, you have the ability to configure that however you want. We've also added buffering capability within the logging driver as well if you want to add more buffering capability in case you can't hit or reach the endpoint to be able to send the, the events coming from standard out, standard error. Last but not least, so we've introduced in November um, our, both on Docker Hub and Docker Store, some of the images, as I was mentioning, for Splunk Enterprise and Splunk Universal Forwarder. We're averaging on average around uh, over 300 pulls per day. And as, as Christian said, this doesn't come from our Jenkins. We have our own <laughs> trusted registry. <laughs> yes, just our Jenkins. Too. So it, it's, we're getting a lot of adoption in some of the images that we have. All of the code is public on GitHub in terms of how we build these images. Certainly would recommend you looking at them and, and try giving them a try. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Christian and let cool. him talk to you about his experience at Splunk. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, next slide. Um, has anybody heard of Built before uh, when being in Germany, when being in Europe? Anyone? Okay, good. Um, so I'm Christian, head of IT operations, Builty E. Uh, who is Builty E? We are uh, Europe's largest news portal. Uh, we have roughly 20 million unique uh, users per month, which is, which is a quarter of the German's population. Germany's population. We have roughly 500 journalists around the globe, 70 in IT staff working, and we have a premium uh, premium content strategy and have 350,000 subscribers. Um, our technology stack is quite simple. We use Akamai as a CDN. We use Varnish Cache. We have a pretty interesting uh, uh, approach. We have Docker for every, uh, everything in Docker, means everything in terms of everything, like databases, our Splunk indexer, forwarder, Tomcats, Postgres, etc. Um, we have Tomcats, of course. We have Postgres. The Oracle is the only thing that is outsourced. And we use Chef for configuration management. And of course, we use Splunk. That's why I'm here. Uh, our Docker key benefits, you are at a Docker conference, not, uh, not necessarily uh, much to say. The uh, key, key takeaways for us were, was, uh, were simplified app deployment and uh, a consistent environment between dev and station tests and 
production, sorry. Um, and ex encapsulation and dependency is solved as well for us. So, and we're uh, right about to uh, start with a Kubernetes cluster to move on to the next stage. Uh, our approach, how to get data into Splunk from those 50 options you have seen from Mark, we have taken the one that uh, is using the Splunk forwarder. Um, we have a con convention where when you write an application that has to log into the var log uh, directory of that container, we mount that directory into a host volume, uh, into a unique one, have the Docker, uh, the Splunk forwarder, forwarder uh, mounting that parent of that directory, and there's a pretty cool um, thing here, uh, note the three dots saying recursively search for anything that is called tem Tomcat log. And even if we have roughly 100, 100 different kind of containers, the roots are like 15 or so to kept, uh, capture all the DNS, Postgres logs, etc. So that's basically it, how we ingest all the logs. Our Splunk key benefits are, uh, we are using Splunk not just for operation, we are providing this as a service to software engineer, engineering teams like <clears throat> or QA uh, with a clear focus on application management. What we achieve here is improve uh, platform uh, stability, uh, improve the quality by uh, finding issues before users do, by comparing performance over day, like compared with yesterday, has that changed? Uh, compare over version, compare production with test, is that different somehow? Finding rock clients, if for example, uh, people are grabbing our content from our platform or are misbehaving, we can identify uh, quite simply uh, broken partner integrations or if something is wrong in our content management system. As well, what, what we achieve is to improve the software quality uh, because what we do is we have just a single uh, gear, zero redundant uh, cluster in Splunk and we ingest everything into that single cluster no matter if it's uh, infrastructure logs or if it's uh, test environment logs or if it's um, production logs. So what we do is uh, ingest everything and have the ability, so everyone has the ability to look into everything with some minor exceptions that we mask IP addresses of users and sensitive data is being kept into uh, specific indexes where access control applies. But in general, we, we could easily say that 95% of our data, which is uh, ingested into Splunk, is visible to everyone. Uh, what uh, this allows us to have uh, people from other teams building dashboards on their own. Uh, we can share dashboards, so we use the same dashboard between test environments and production. And if people like QA, are, who are not developers, are not uh, happy to learn another query language, what they, they can do is to uh, use the data models and pivots. It is for the user's experience like working with Excel, so you can build your own reports and on dashboards uh, like an Excel. That's it. And all this comes together with a very minimal operation effort from our perspective, from operations team, we are just five. So, and the only thing that we have to do and when working with Splunk is update it frequently uh, whenever there's a new minor version upcoming. So how does that look like in action? Um, so not, since we have all the Tomcat logs in our um, uh, Splunk now, I can easily type that query and we'll find, oh, there's a uh, stack overflow or I can easily search for an out of memory error. So what you can do with that is either build a dashboard or an, create an alert that page, pages you during midnight. Or what you can even uh, further do is filter just page if that uh, alert is coming from a test, uh, not in, from a test environment. Or something else is uh, we are uh, massively doing access log magic in Splunk. Access logs are the logs that are being written from your Apache or from your uh, Nginx. And what we can uh, search here is if there's a request that had a 500 uh, temporary server error or whether a render time was beyond your expectation. And of course, you wouldn't uh, alert on a single occurrence. What you can easily do is to add some more mathematics here to calculate the percentage between the good requests and the bad ones. So 200 and 300 versus 400 and 500 and alert on that one. And what you can do as well is to find if there's something suspicious in your platform. Again, here an example using the access log where someone pretends to be a Googlebot, uh, uh, doing a, a Googlebot request, but the IP location, what we are looking here, uh, uh, what we're looking up here is um, not coming from Mountain View. So Google has, uh, Google, Splunk has a pretty cool feature using lookup functionality where you look up the IP address, which is in your access log uh, in the field called client IP and it returns the, the city or the uh, other locations like country, et cetera. Um, finally, 
what we do is um, whenever you read a log file, what, like with tail, with less, whatever, what you do is you filter your log files mentally with everything that is not important, info, uh, warning, etc. You just scan to error, exceptions, etc. Uh, Splunk helps here a lot by providing a feature called event types. So once you found them, you mark them, this is my event type. Uh, so for that uh, stack overflow or out of memory, you just call it error software stack overflow. And um, so once you have done that for your platform, you can easily build a time shot on, an, uh, on the mood of your um, platform. And in this case here, we had an uh, incident where the fiber line was broken between our two data centers. And so apparently the failover failed as well. So routing got wrong and people started to face HTTP 500, which is the first line. And immediately after that, our uh, uptime monitoring was reporting in, uh, issues as well. And as you can see, during the whole day before, there was some, some noise, maybe from some test automation systems, et cetera. It didn't filter properly, apparently. So this is how to figure out immediately what's going on. And with um, having additional metadata on your, your fields, uh, on your query, you can easily uh, dig uh, even further. So now we know there are HTTP 500s in, in your platform. You can find out, oh, that's the first data center. Okay, so first data center. Now you have to field called network tier, for example, ah, it's network tier 23, for example, this is causing the issue that helps us to spot the issue quite immediately and tell your network operator, your data center operator, it's that tier that has a problem and you, we just turn off the, the traffic from that data center uh, while it was being fixed. So handing over back to Mark. All right, great, thank you, Christian. Yep. So in terms of a call to action, uh, certainly would recommend getting the, the latest versions of uh, a Splunk available on Hub or Docker Store, and uh, trying it out. If you haven't tried it, try to getting started uh, from, from, uh, from GitHub. You can usually get going within minutes, and uh, we have excellent demos at our booths so come over, and as I was mentioning, great after party. If you, haven't, uh, if you have no plans tonight, come and see us, come register for, for the party. I'll open it up for questions. I think we have four minutes, so Ooh. if there's any questions. There's no uh, mic, so you can just stand up or speak up, and we can. Any questions? Anything at all? No. Perfect. <laughs> right. Good. Oh, yes. So, um, so as far as monitoring that you were doing there, what level of granularity do you have in terms of time frames? Is it down to seconds or minutes? Or what's the level of granularity you have? I'll leave it to you, to me. Well, what do you do? Okay, so it's not being compressed at all. So you uh, start as long as you have uh, disk space. Uh, and you can define it per index. How long do you keep uh, the data? And you can define retention. So keep it for the first uh, 90 days on an SSD disk, and then move it further to an NFS or whatever. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so both um, from, a, from a both collection frequency, right? you can just define that based on how you collect the data, right? Uh, depending if you pull for the data, so you can collect it. And then you can determine the retention policies however you want. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Licensing, perfect. Uh, so licensing is based on daily ingestion, right? So you can keep the data as long as we want, as you want, doesn't matter, but it's all based on what you in, in, ingest within um, a day. So it's based by price by gigabytes, terabytes. So whether you're just getting started at small gigabytes, get started, and then we can easily scale with the same platform to we have customers that are um, you know, ingesting as much data as you know, petabytes per day of data, right? So we scale quite large. Any other questions? All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm here from Atlassian in, uh, in Sydney. Great to be here in Austin to talk to you guys about uh, Bitbucket Pipelines, and our, uh, which is our containerized continuous delivery solution. So um, I've been talking to a lot of people here at DockerCon. We've got a great booth over in the exhibition area. And um, through my deep research, I found out that you guys are all massive fans of containers. It's, um, it's great. I'm a fan of containers, too. Uh, what I'm here to talk to you about is how containers are great for continuous delivery. So uh, something you might not have thought about before. Hope to share with you some insights around that. What do I mean by continuous delivery? Uh, I'm talking about uh, code always being deployable, about automated tests and automated deployment. Uh, so if you have automated tests, you have automated CD, uh, you're doing continuous delivery. And we want to help people get to that point with their software. So who in the audience does uh, CI or CD today? Put your hands up. Right, that's almost everyone, that's great. You guys are the good guys. There's a lot of people out there who are not doing this, and great to see so many hands up. 
Um, but what you would know if you're doing CI and CD is you have a lot of pain with CI and CD. Um, you have things like complex build scripts and deployment scripts. You know, this is a really common pain point. Uh, these scripts get out of control really fast. Uh, they take a lot of maintenance on their own. Some teams even have to end up testing their own, uh, writing tests for their test scripts, you know, because it gets, uh, gets so complicated. You've got infrastructure to maintain. You've got your own uh, hardware, potentially. Uh, if you're using cloud, you might have to set up images and AMIs and maintain those when, when you add a new dependency or change the version of a database you're using, things like that. There's a lot of overhead with infrastructure. For the dev teams, uh, you've got to deal with multiple tools. So your devs are switching between a pull request, uh, going back to their build, the build pass, oh, it didn't pass, we need to update the pull request again, let's go back to the source, source code. You know, you're going back and forth, uh, wasting time there. And uh, last but not least, there's this slow feedback loop around builds. Uh, you know, there's queues, uh, there's a limited set of agents, uh, often, if you're running things yourself, potentially. Uh, there's the VM startup, you know, that's, that's costly if you're running on, uh, like, EC2 or, or running things on your own VM platform. It all costs dev time. It, it takes your team time to get the feedback they need to move forward. So these are the problems we set out to solve with Bitbucket Pipelines. Uh, it's a new feature in Bitbucket. It launched uh, in October last year. And what it offers is painless CI CD. It's built on Docker, and it's integrated with your code. So let's have a quick look at uh, Bitbucket Pipelines now. I've got a demo for you. So this is the, the normal UI of Bitbucket. Uh, you see here a simple Node.js repository. We're going to go ahead and enable pipelines on this. So you start, uh, you head over to the left sidebar. There's a pipelines option there. You click it. This is going to be really fast. You won't find any CI server that's this easy to set up. You enable pipelines like this. And then we have a set of predefined build configurations for all the popular languages. You pick the one that you want and you'll get a sample YAML configuration file for Bitbucket Pipelines. And as you can see there, it's very simple. It specifies a Docker image that you're going to use. It specifies a few build commands. Uh, and that's usually all you need to get started. You hit Next. It takes you to an editor where you can uh, make some tweaks to customize it, make sure it's going to work for your code repo. So in this case, I'm just going to delete the npm version command, leave it running the default kind of install and test. And then I'm going to pop a commit message in and, and commit that change back to Bitbucket. What you see then is you go to the pipelines page, and it's already running. That's all you had to do to get it up and going. Now, every time someone commits to this repo, they're going to get a build run automatically on Bitbucket pipelines. It's fully hosted. You don't have to do anything else. It's running your code for you in a Docker container, running your tests with NPM, and bringing the results back. If you click through uh, to the build, this is just running the, the one for the commit that I just made. Uh, you go straight into the running build here. You can see the log files. It spun up the Docker container for you. And now it's running npm install. It has streaming log support, so you can see uh, your build as it's running. Nice color coding, too. As that build keeps running, you'll get, you get all the log output there. And it collapses each command down as it, as it completes. Once it finishes, you'll see that the build goes successful up in the top left there. You've got the, fill, uh, the full build log available if you want to uh, jump in and take a look at it. So here we'll pop open the NPM test. So this is just like a typical CI server. You have access to all the build logs. You can download the logs if you need to. Uh, but it's all available directly within Bitbucket, tightly there, close to your code. You can see as well the, the build status shows up through the, through the product as well. So if you go back to the repository homepage, you get the build status for all your repositories. And then if you go to the commit list or the branch list, you also get the build status there integrated in. And this is great when you're looking to find the last, last good version of uh, your software to deploy or, or run. So a quick recap on how it works. Every time someone pushes uh, code to Bitbucket, uh, you have a YAML configuration file that specifies the, the node image that you're using and a build script. Uh, it, Pipeline starts up a build container for you. So in this case, it's going to start up the node image. It puts a clone of your repository into the build image. And then it runs the script that you've configured. If all the commands that you've run come with a uh, successful status code, then you'll get a, a green build. 
Under the hood, how we're uh, putting this together, some people might be curious. Um, we have a, a large Kubernetes cluster that has a set of uh, large EC2 instances. Um, each worker has 32 gigs of memory. And what we do inside that is we run a pod for every customer. So each customer's builds isolated from each other. Uh, it runs a set of containers in there, one container for your actual build, one for your clone from Bitbucket, and then a set of containers for um, running the actual pipeline infrastructure. And we do that across as many workers are, are needed to scale out the build infrastructure. So we always have capacity available. Uh, you have unlimited concurrency as well on pipelines, and so you're able to run as many builds as you need. Uh, we pipe in a commit queue there, so it has all the commits that are landing on all the enabled repositories across Bitbucket. Once the builds succeed or, part or, or fail, uh, we send the build status back to the Bitbucket uh, UI, so you can see it there. And then we send out notifications, um, email, and also to HipChat and Slack. So what that means for you is compared to running your own CI service or um, even some of the other hosted offerings, you know, we always have build capacity available. You don't have to wait for VMs to start up because the containers are like much faster to start up. We're talking like seconds for running builds instead of minutes. And we've got unlimited concurrency. So uh, you, won't, you won't find yourself limited to just two, two concurrent builds or anything like that um, to switch to an expensive plan. Uh, the way we charge for pipelines is by minutes of usage. And your developers can run things as concurrently as they want. And that's just a benefit of, of running on Docker, running with this platform that we've built. Uh, but you don't have to trust me that it's great. We get uh, tons of tweets every week about how much people love Bibark pipelines. Uh, I was really surprised when uh, I joined the team recently. I didn't think people would really fall in love with their CI server. But apparently, with pipelines, you can. So this is, uh, this is great. Um, but wh why so much love for the tool? Uh, the benefits we keep hearing, people love uh, having an integrated platform. As I mentioned before, you've got the um, history and the commit list. You've got uh, information in pull requests as well. So when you're running pull requests with your team, you can make sure that the build's passing before you merge it in. And again, pipelines are just a click away so that when you're in your pull request, you can just click straight over to see the, what the build is doing. Did the build pass? Did it not? Look at the logs. Uh, rerun it again. Make some quick changes to the code, even if you need to, through Bitbox Online Editor. It's all very easy. Uh, Config as code is a huge benefit. I'm sure many of you are using this today with lots of other tools. Um, obviously, it's versioned and stored with the application, which is a, a great thing. But um, we see some less obvious benefits as well uh, for CI with uh, configuration as code. So one thing is a branching workflow that you can use for your CI a CD configuration. So typically with a you know, legacy build server like Jenkins, you might log in make some changes through the UI, and then just hope that the build passes afterwards. And if it didn't pass, then you go in and do it again. With a, a versioned configuration as code, you can test your branch changes on a separate branch CI config, uh, stage them, make sure that the build configuration is passing or the deployment configuration is passing before you push it to master. Um, the second one, and maybe even more important, is really pushing dev ownership of, uh, or DevOps ownership of uh, the build configuration. So one anti-pattern we see, particularly with large companies, is that uh, the build scripts sometimes end up being owned by the build engineering team rather than by the developers that uh, own the application. And we strongly believe that the developers that own the application should own their entire deployment pipeline as well, and really pushing that configuration ownership back into the repo into the, under the dev team's control is a really important idea, I think, for modern DevOps teams. Uh, Bitbucket Pipelines has all the integrations you'd expect. so. Uh, all the popular cloud providers are there for deploying to Azure, AWS, Google. Uh, we have a, a bunch of uh, testing integrations as well. So if you guys use uh, Browser Stack or uh, Buddy Build is a great partner for mobile builds as well. We have uh, all the functionality you need to do your uh, testing and validation and uh, deployment with uh, Bitbucket Pipelines. And lastly, I don't need to convince you guys that uh, containers are great, but why are they great for CI, CD? Um, they're fast. You know, they start up a lot faster than um, a lot of other hosted systems that are using VMs, uh, spinning up EC2 instances every time you need a build. Uh, Docker Hub's great. You know, people are using tons of open source uh, tools these days, and being able to pull your build environment straight from Docker Hub gives people, you know, that speed that you saw just to get your environment up and going so quickly. Uh, if you don't find what you need in Docker Hub, you can obviously build on Docker to uh, put together a custom build environment really easily. Uh, you know, it's one Docker file away, and then you've got your own build environment that's versioned and managed properly. 
And lastly, it's uh, reproducible. So uh, running the build uh, locally can become just as easy as uh, bringing up a Docker container and running the tests. So uh, even more interesting, I think, is we've got two great new Docker features that are launching today. Uh, the first one is, is Docker build and push support. So this has been a very highly requested feature for pipelines. Uh, and this is really about taking your Docker images, uh, your Docker configuration that's in Bitbucket, pipe, in Bitbucket, building it with pipelines, and then uh, pushing those images up to Docker Hub or any container registry that you use. Could be a private registry as well. It's got a really simple configuration. So all you need to do to enable this is pop in a little option there with Docker equals true. And then the Docker commands are available for you to run in your build script. So it's that easy to, uh, in this case, create a, um, a new image, um, log in to an authenticated uh, registry, and push it up there. Uh, the reason we have that option there to enable Docker is true is because we saw, saw a slight uh, startup time penalty for running Docker for all our containers. So if we uh, find a way to optimize that away, we can go back to not having any requirements at all to run Docker. It'll just be seamless. Um, unfortunately, we didn't want to put the penalty onto every single build of slowing down startup time by maybe a second or two uh, in some circumstances. So in the UI, um, you'll just see it there as a command, your Docker commands. Uh, you get the full log output as well. And you know it's easy to debug what's going on with that. So th this works really seamlessly. It's really, really great. So Docker build and push support is now live, available in Bitbucket pipelines. The second feature I want to talk about today is service containers. It's a little bit more complex. So this is about the ability to run multiple containers inside pipelines, particularly for uh, people want to use it for integration testing. So uh, we find a lot of people want to spin up a database. Uh, maybe they've got a microservices application. They want to spin up uh, multiple services inside pipelines and test them together. This feature does that. Again, here we have a very simple configuration example. This is a node uh, application again. And it needs a database and a Redis cache in order to run its tests. So uh, in the build step, or the, the branch that you're running on, you configure the services you need. And then lower in the build file, you configure the, the definitions for those services. So you can see it's very simple here. It's just an image name, a bunch of environment variables. So compared to maybe some other tools, um, there's some interesting features of pipelines services. The first is that the configuration is done at the branch level, which we think is really important, because often you have different branches have different testing needs. You might want to run your full integration tests maybe only on your integration branch, and every developer is just running a simpler uh, set of tests. So we wanted to make sure that the services uh, were branch specific. Um, there's no network configuration. So I don't know if you look at a typical Docker Compose file or anything similar, you see a lot of port mappings where you're like mapping port 3000 to port 3000, you know, over and over and over again. You don't have to do that with uh, pipelines because we run in uh, Kubernetes, the um, network King config we have is that all the services share the same network interface. And so it's just like opening the, the port on localhost. There's no need to, um, to map the ports between the different containers. They're just transparently exposed to the services within your build, just within your build. Obviously, each customer is completely sandboxed. <clears throat> and lastly, there's no memory configuration as well. So uh, at the moment, we're using sensible defaults to fit within the uh, four gigabyte limit. Um, eventually, there's a new feature coming in Docker that we're keen to take advantage of, which is uh, shared uh, memory allocation across a group of containers. So that's, uh, that's something we're looking forward to in the future. Um, at the moment, we uh, feel like it's much simpler to have all the configuration into, in your pipelines config. As I said, you don't need ports, you don't need memory, you don't need volume mapping. There's a lot of stuff there that you don't need that might be in a typical compose file. And so we have had a few requests for Docker Compose. And so if, you, if anyone's interested in talking more about that, I'd be really keen to understand uh, you know, exactly how you're testing things and what, what your use cases are. So please come and talk to me later if you have questions about that. In the UI for pipelines, uh, the services show up as tabs here in the log, log area. So it's really easy to see which services you're running. Uh, you can click between them. You get the same streaming log output that you saw before uh, for each service. So as your build's running, if there's problems, if things are failing, uh, you can easily jump into the service logs and see, you know, is MySQL start up correctly? Uh, you could configure it to produce extra logging output and debug your problems that way as well. So we feel like this is a really, really great feature for Bitbucket pipelines. It really closes out 
um, a lot of the testing use cases that people have been asking for. And when you look at the typical application, uh, now, if, if we go through the like typical test, build, and deploy lifecycle, we feel like we can meet all the needs there. So if you start with your uh, pre-baked build container, you're pulling that down from your Docker registry, running that up to as your build environment, you, you compile up uh, and package your uh, service. Uh, you can test it now. You spin up a couple of services with pipelines, uh, integrate them together, and make sure that everything's working properly. Uh, once that's done, you build your Docker image, you push it up to the registry. You can then trigger the deployment of that out to whichever provider you're using. And this whole cycle being so fast, being automated, being in the cloud, it's, it's so easy to react to problems as well. So if you find that something's gone wrong after you've pushed it out, you can go back to the start again, commit a quick change, push it out to your production environment really quickly. So again, you don't have to take my word for it. We have uh, alpha customers that have been trying this out over the last couple of months. Um, <coughs> Bernie Lee's here, sorry, is um, replacing Jenkins, and he's taken hours and hours of Jenkins configuration and replaced it with a really simple pipelines config. And uh, Chris Knight from Heavenly uh, has been working with us as well, and they use pipelines for their CD strategy now, and they go from a developer pushing to Bitbucket to live on their website in less than a minute. So these are the kind of uh, use cases we want to see. These are the things we're excited about, uh, development in the cloud. So my homework for you is to uh, drop some code in Bitbucket, you know, super easy. Even if you're using GitHub, you know, it only takes a couple of commands to like set your remote and push, push some code into Bitbucket. Try out pipelines and uh, let us know what you think. Thank you. So I have a couple of minutes for questions as well, if anybody has anything. Yeah, down here. Oh, sorry, in the dark shirt. Just behind you. Yeah, the question was, is this available in the on-premise version of Bitbucket 2? Uh, not at the moment. So um, at Atlassian, we're really trying to uh, push development in the cloud forward. And so uh, we're launching um, this in, just in the cloud at the moment. We want to see what the feedback is, and then we'll consider launching an on-premise version in the future if there's interest. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. How does this play with Bamboo? How does this play with Bamboo? Yeah. Uh, so Bamboo is our on-premise offering for CI, and this is our hosted version. We have some great features in Bamboo for building with Docker as well, but it's not quite as seamless and integrated at the moment. Um, we'd like to, we're going to keep improving Bamboo. We have a team working hard on Bamboo as well. Uh, but this is a slightly different direction just because of the capabilities we have with Bitbucket in the cloud. We can, you know, we can spin up provision stuff much more easily. We're in full control of the infrastructure. And so, um, yeah, this, a feature like this is, you know, was much easier for us to build in the host environment first. And then we're going to be able to prove it out and see what people really need in an on-premises version future. Yeah, at the front here. Yeah, I can talk more about pricing, yeah. So um, our pricing is actually just being announced today, I believe. Oh, yeah, so it'll take effect from next month. So we're currently still uh, free to try out pipelines. Um, the, <coughs> sorry, the pricing model will be that um, based on your tier of usage in Bitbucket, you'll get a free allocation of minutes, build minutes. Um, but that's really just designed as a taster, I guess. Like it, prob it may cover some small teams, but it won't cover a medium or a large size team. And so the build minutes are charged at $10 for 1,000 minutes. And so most teams that we see use maybe two, 300 minutes per month. And so we're expecting that most people will spend like $10 a month on their CI, something like that. So we feel like that's really very competitive compared to what's out there in the market. Like I said before, there's no concurrency limit as well with pipelines. So you know, your developers are never blocked waiting for each other to, to build something. Yeah. Any, other, uh, any other questions? Oh, yeah, over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just like a public node image. Yeah. Uh, is there support for like private images that are maybe also hosted on the hub? Yeah, yeah. The question was, um, is there support for um, private images hosted on Docker Hub? Uh, yes, there is. And there's also support for private registries as well. So you can um, specify a register URL in the image definition and then authentication. Um, one thing I didn't show, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, is uh, uh, the security features of pipelines. So you can have secure variables that are actually stored in a secure um, secure key store within Docker, and then, I mean, they're within your build container. They're exposed as environment variables. So, um, but we do some we do some clever things to like obscure them in log files and things like that. So, yeah, you can pass credentials in fairly securely into your uh, build container as well. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. When you spoke about um, being able to test a bill locally, yeah. um, is that just because you can run those commands, or do you have a tool that would like, parse the YAML file and set up the services? Right, yeah, the question is do we have like a CLI tool or something like that to run uh, pipelines builds locally for, for testing purposes? At the moment, we don't. Uh, you need to spin it up yourself and run it. Um, so start it with Docker, run your commands. Um, that's something we're thinking about for the future. I think it would be a, a good addition. So yeah, if you're interested in that, uh, come, come by the booth, let us know, and we'll consider it. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Yep, the back. What about uh, output, like build metrics? <clears throat> yeah, um, at the moment, we, we don't support that in the UI. Um, sorry, the question was, uh, do we show build metrics, JUnit, test output, things like that? Can we parse out the output of the build and, and show it in a better, better way in the UI? Uh, at the moment, we don't have <clears throat> any specific features around that at the moment. Um, but it is a highly voted feature request to have JUnit test reports. So that's something we'll be looking at probably very soon, the, um, particularly for test reporting. Uh, more, more advanced reporting, uh, yeah, we're still up in the air a bit. We want to build out our deployment functionality as well and not be uh, too focused on just the testing side of things. Like for a lot of teams that we talk to these days, um, you know, they have, they have a test suite that they want to run. But uh, they also want to have uh, really good deployment functionality, a bit of environment uh, information about like which, did deployments go out successfully, which environments are deployments running in, and things like that. So we'll, be, um, we'll probably be looking a little bit more on that side in the short term, I think, but also looking at uh, basic level test reporting. Yeah. Uh, I think we're out of time. So um, thanks, everyone. We'll see you at the booth if you have more questions.